Hello everyone. Today we'll be talking about the theory behind beam element. Beam element is a one dimensional element. So that means the degree of freedom at each node depends only in one dimension X. We can have multiple degree of freedoms in different direction. We can have U, V and theta, but all of them depend only on X direction. <coughs> We talked about other types of one dimensional element earlier. We had bar element, link, trusses. Today we are going to talk about beam and also frame element. So, frame elements are the combination of beam as well as bar elements. And then the application of beam elements is vast in mechanical engineering. We can model bridges. We can find a deflection of shafts, pipes using beam elements. And because they are one dimensional, so they are very computationally efficient. If we can get away with one dimension, there is no need to go into two dimensional or three dimensional uh, element types. There are two common theories for uh, beam elements. Or is Euler-Bernoulli and Timoshenko. Euler-Bernoulli assumes that the cross-section is perpendicular to the bending line. So if you look at this picture, you can see that the cross-section at any time during the formation is perpendicular to the bending line. And that means that we are neglecting the effect of shear deformation. We still have shear force, but our deformation is only function of the bending moment, not the shear force. And every assumption introduces an error. The error that we are going to see using Euler Bernoulli is that our beam appears to be stiffer. So it's going to have higher stiffness based on the assumption that we made because we are not allowing rotation of cross section or warping of cross section. And that means that if you are looking at deflection, our deflection is going to be underestimated using Euler Bernoulli. Or if you're looking at critical load in buckling, critical load is going to be overestimated. This theory is applicable. This assumption is reasonable when we are talking about slender beams, the beams that the cross section is much smaller than the length of the beam. The other theory, which is a little bit more complicated, but it's more accurate is Timoshenko beam. So Timoshenko does not have the assumption that we used for Euler Bernoulli, it allows the rotation of cross section and the warping of the cross section. So we can include the effect of shear deformation into our analysis. Uh, while for slender beam, we don't need to use Timoshenko beam, but as the beam gets stubby or for short fat beam, then we have to use Timoshenko beam. And if the beam is really, the cross section is very large, it's better to use uh, solid elements, 2D elements, rather than using 1D elements. The choice between Euler Bernoulli and Timoshenko comes into uh, play when you are looking at slenderness ratio. If you want to judge which theory we need to use, we can look at that ratio and evaluate the accuracy of Euler Bernoulli. You can see when that slender ratio is high, then the Timoshenko and Euler Bernoulli have almost the same prediction. But as the slender ratio decreases, then our assumption is not accurate and we could have up to 12% uh, error just by using a wrong uh, theory. And in this equation, we have G A L squared E I G and E are material properties and A, L, and I are uh, geometry uh, properties that are defined here. So we are going to find uh, uh, our beam theory based on Euler Bernoulli. So if you look at this rectangle as an undeformed shape of our beam after deformation and assuming that we are having positive moment on each side, and that's the convention that we use, the, the moment is assumed the positive if it creates the opposite, it, it creates a positive curvature. And this line would be the center line, which is not going to be under tension or compression. It keeps the original length. 
and we know the curvature by the curvature radius. So the curvature is equal to one over rho, which means that if rho is very high, we have very little curvature. So for a flat beam, the curvature is at infinity. If we look at the deformed uh, geometry and take a, a differential element, look at this differential element over here, we can see that is a, <clears throat> we have d theta. That's the center line. The original length would be x, which is on the center line after the deformation we have x prime. The radius of curvature is rho, and y is the distance from the center line to any point of interest. If you are looking at the strain, the strain x direction would be the final length x prime minus the original length divided by the original length. If you look at the geometry, you can see x prime is rho plus y. That would be this two times d theta will give us x prime. And the same thing for x, that would be rho d theta. And if we simplify that, d theta would go away. And the equation that we are going to have at the end is y over rho. So for Euler Bernoulli beams, we can see that epsilon x, the strain in x direction is function of y, where in cross section we are looking at, and the radius of curvature. So if y is negative, we are in compression, so epsilon x would be negative. So anything about this line would have a negative strain than anything below this line is gonna have a positive strain. So you can see developing strain in X direction is uh, different than previous approaches that we had. We don't have access to U, so we can't say partial U with respect to X. We need to define and develop our strain equation based on the curvature and the location of cross section. So we develop Epsilon x, now we're going to continue and find the relation between the geometry and the loading and the geometry. So according to Hooke's law, sigma x is E epsilon x. We are talking about a 1D element, so I don't need to use elasticity tensor that we use for a 2D or 3D element. It's just E epsilon x. And if I replace epsilon x, it would be E y over rho. And also I know according to the structural equation, Sigma x is m y over i, so I have two stresses here. If I set them equal and cancel y, I can find the relation between the geometry one over rho, which is the curvature. Uh, so my, my loaded moments. So now look at the curvature to see if we can find a curvature. Curvature is uh, dependent on the deformation or deflection of the beam. And we have this exact equation, but as engineers, we would like to simplify our equation. So we are saying that if the slope is very small, if dv over dx is small, it's close to zero. So that term goes away. So it's just one rho is equal to second derivative of displacement in y direction with respect to x. And if I set these two equals, I can find my Euler-Bernoulli equation. So this is our basis for uh, finding deformation in, um, in the beam. So if you look at this equation, we can see that uh, I can take a derivative of this equation if I take a derivative of moment, I have a shear, so I can find the relation between shear and alpha here would be the third derivative of V with respect to X. I can find, I can take another derivative on the left side, I have the fourth derivative, and then here uh, I have the distributed load WX. Or I can take an integration here, if the second derivative would be curvature, if I take an integration, the first integral will give me the slope, then the second integral will give me the deflection. And that's how uh, we find deflections uh, using Euler-Bernoulli theory. So looking at Euler-Bernoulli beam theory, here we started with this. We derived the equation for internal bending moment. If I take one integral, as we discussed, I can find the slope. And 
we are going to have an integration constant that we can find by uh, applying boundary condition. If I take another integral, I find a deflection. Here, if I take a derivative instead of taking an integral, we know the derivative of moment would be our shear load. So here, pay attention that we have, we show the shear load with capital V, and also displacement in Y with a small v. So make sure you don't uh, confuse these two. And if I take another uh, derivative, the derivative of uh, shear force with respect to X would give me my distributed load that I have. So I have technically four equations, but all of them are, are one. I've seen uh, each of them are used as a euler bernoulli beam theory, but it's just a matter of taking derivative or taking of integral depending on uh, what we need. So here I'm showing you the shear moment diagram for a distributed loading so we can evaluate the equation that we developed better. So we can start here at the bottom if you have a moment, a moment is second order. So if I take a derivative, my shear would be linear as you can see. Also if I take another derivative, then my distributed load that has to be constant as you can see is, is constant. Or we normally have the loading and then go back and find uh, the moment and uh, shear force. So if this one is constant, if you take an integral, your shear has to be linear and your moment has to be second order. We can take uh, integral further here from the moment and then find a slope. So the slope has to be the third order and then take Another integral will get deflection, and deflection has to be fourth order. So in FBA, loads can only be applied on the nodes. So if you have a distributed load and you want to model this beam with distributed load with one element, means two nodes, you have to put all these loads in these two nodes, because loads can only be applied on the nodes. So when we had simply supported, it was easy because the support could not carry any moments. So we divided the force between the two. But here, in addition to forces, we have moments as well. So it makes it a little bit more challenging. Here I'm showing you the answer, but we are going to go ahead and find these forces as well. Uh, here, we are gonna find the reaction forces and then the opposite direction of reaction forces would be the equivalent load on, on each node. Uh, remember that we are, our objective is not to find reaction forces. Our objective here is to find the equivalent load. But for this simple case, the equivalent load would be the same as the reaction forces on, uh, on each node. So let's look at our beam. When we want to solve a Euler Bernoulli problem, uh, we make a section cut. Let's say we have a section cut from here, we call it our X. So on one side, I just ignore, I, I can keep right or left side. So here I've ignored the right side. I'm just looking at the left. I have reaction forces here at the cut. I have a shear force and I have moment. I don't know their direction, so I'm just going to assume a positive direction. And positive here for a moment is to create a, a positive curvature, or what I would like to call it, creates a happy face. And for shear, let's draw the, the eyes too. And for the shear, creates a clockwise motion. So if I take a moment about point C, about point of cut, I can see I have Mx, this M which is function of X, and then this R1 is creating a clockwise motion about this point. If I assume counterclockwise to be positive, this one is creating a clockwise, so it would be negative. I have M1, I don't need to multiply it by any moment R, and it's counterclockwise. I have Wx, so for this I need to draw the loading as well. The loading, if it's W, 
the magnitude of the loading would be Wx, the distance to the point of interest would be x over two. So rearranging the equation to find a moment, we can find a moment equation based on R, M, and Wx. Now we write our euler bernoulli equation, the curvature depends on the moment, and now I replace the moment equation by uh, mx. I take the first integral, I get the slope. So after integration, I get the slope and I get a integration constant. If I take another integral, I find the deflection and I have two integration constants. Looking at this problem, in addition to the two integration constants that we have to find using boundary condition, R1 and M1 are also unknown. We want to find out, so we need four boundary conditions. And we do for a beam with uh, two clamped at each end, it's easy to find a boundary condition at x equals zero. We are not going to have any deflection here. Also, the slope would be zero. So we can find C1 and C2, and both of them are going to be zero. At x equals L, at the other end of the beam, we have the same boundary conditions. So we can find R1 and M1. Here, we have to solve two equations and two unknown. We find the boundary condition, or so we find the, the support load at x equals zero. Now, once we have the support load in one, end of the beam, I just need to write the static equilibrium equations to find the other uh, support loads. And because it's symmetric, so these two are equivalent to these two. So I found the support reactions for a clamped, clamped beam under uniform loading. Uh, you need to remember that the objective is to find the equivalent load on each node, which here would be the opposite direction of the support load that we found. So if you look at equivalent loads for other cases, we can find for other cases and we get this value. So that's to find the equivalent load. You can see here the equivalent load is the opposite direction of the support load. Like these values, the reaction force is towards positive y, but the equivalent load is towards negative y. Once we have found the equivalent load on each node to solve FEA, we need to find a stiffness matrix. Similar to 2D elements, we find a stiffness matrix based on the potential energy. And what is potential energy? It's the combination of strain energy and the work of external forces. So we show potential energy by pi, u plus w, the work of uh, external forces is simple, is F times U. Now we need to find the potential energy. Potential energy is defined as half sigma epsilon dV. We use the same equation to find the stiffness matrix for quadrilateral elements or triangular elements. So we are using the same equation. It's just what we replace it with is uh, for a strain makes a difference between the two elements. So here, I replace the stresses with sigma is E epsilon using Hooke's law. So I have E epsilon squared over two. So now in quadrilateral element, I replace epsilon with BU, my B matrix and, and U. But here, I don't have access to U, but I have, but I know the displacement in Y direction or transverse displacement, and I know epsilon is Y over rho. So, and I have y, and I know rho is the second derivative of displacement, so I'm going to replace epsilon with the value that I found earlier. That's the part that we are going to branch out from quadrilateral element, the value of epsilon. We are talking about epsilon x, but epsilon x depends on the displacement in y direction. So if I replace the values, I get this equation, I'm going to separate y with second derivative of v over x2, and then instead of dv, I'm going to write dA dx. If I do that and then move y squared to dA, can you tell me what is this? 
y squared dA, that would be the second moment of area, or we show it by I, by resistance to bending uh, deformation. So that would be I. I can simplify that, move I here. That would be EI over two, second derivative of transfer displacement squared. So I found the strain energy here. The next step for me is to take second derivative of V, but I need to know what is transfer displacement. How can I find transfer displacement of the beam as function of X? If you remember, we talk about shape function for the beam. A beam with two nodes have four degrees of freedom. Two degrees of freedom at each node, V1 and theta one and because we have four degrees of freedom, our shape function or our uh, interpolation functions would be in third order. So we can write our shape from our transverse displacement as function of X or a function of KC, depending whether we are using the global coordinate or the local coordinate. What you can see is uh, it's a third order. We have four unknowns. We have four boundary conditions, so we can find those four unknowns. After finding the four unknowns, we can write my Vx, the displacement in uh, y direction as function of x. I have my shape functions and I have my nodal displacement. So the format is very similar to other elements that we discussed. But our objective is, was to find the second derivative of V with respect to X. So if you want to take a second derivative of this, these values, the nodal um, shape, the nodal degrees of freedom are constant. So I just need to take second derivative of my shape function. So I call the second derivative of the shape function D or D matrix, which is the same order as my shape function is one by four. So remember we had, remember we had B matrix for quadrilateral or uh, triangular elements. For beam elements, we deal with D matrix. Again, to compare the two, B matrix was the first derivative of our displacement with respect to X. And here the D matrix is uh, the second derivative of our shape function with respect to uh, X. So now that we found the second derivative, we can go back to our equation and uh, find the stiffness matrix. So uh, if I will replace, I know that the second derivative is DU, but I have to my objective is to have it this square, so I can replace it here and in matrix multiplication if I want to find it to the power of two, I have to take a transport so I can multiply the matrices together and then remember AB is equals to B transpose, A transpose. So if I take transpose of it, the multiplication, I have to switch the order as well, AB equals B transpose A transpose. So now these values, I can plug it here and find a strain energy. And then I have strain energy, plus I added the external uh, forces here as well to find the potential energy. If I, if I want to minimize the potential energy, I take a derivative with respect to U. That's how we find a stiffness matrix in finite element. We find a potential energy and we are going to minimize it based on U, which means that taking a derivative and set it to zero. If we do that, you can find that on this component, the derivative of this component would be only F. The other component, we have two U, so U is squared. We have two in the denominator here as well. They, they cancel each other. It would be EI uh, and the rest of our integral. So if we compare these values with F equals KU, we can find K. So if I compare this F equals K U, I can find my K matrix. 
So this is my K matrix here for beam elements. A function of D, D is the second derivative of my shape function. Once finding the thickness matrix, our job is almost done. In FEA, our first task is to find a stiffness matrix. Once we find the stiffness matrix for our element, then the procedure is the same regardless of what FBA problem we are solved. We need to find a local stiffness matrix, then a global stiffness matrix, then the loading, then we find the nodal displacements, and then reaction forces, stresses, strains, and, and so forth. So our first task and most important task is, is, is done with some the stiffness matrix. And if I do the integration, so uh, replace it with D values, I find the K matrix here for beam elements. So this is the K matrix for beam elements. Remember, we derived the equation for a beam element with two nodes and two degrees of freedom per node. So four degrees of freedom for the element. And you can see the stiffness matrix follows that and is four by four, equivalent to our degrees of freedom. So if you have a beam element which has three nodes, then your stiffness matrix would not look this like this and it would be six by six. Or at each node, we have more degrees of freedom. If it's 3D, we have displacement in Z direction as well. Then again, your stiffness matrix would be different. But the equation for a stiffness matrix would be the same. We just need to take a second derivative of our shape function. So if you look at this stiffness matrix, you can, you can see it depends on E, the material property, Young's modulus, I, L, cubed, and then each component in, in our matrix. So for each element, it's easy to find each component. And the equation for a stiffness matrix, uh, um, I've written it up here, and you just need to apply this equation for any beam elements that, that you have. But the most common one is a beam element with two nodes. Each node has two degrees of freedom, displacement in y direction, and the rotation at that node. Now we are gonna solve an example. So for this example, it's distributed loading. And we have a support here. Uh, the material property is given to us is 200 gigapascals. So it's the property of steel. And then I, second moment of area is given to us. So we don't need to factor that I. We need to find that the vertical displacement or V and rotation that nodes two and three as well as the reaction forces at node one and two. So looking at the problem, we have to at least use two elements. One element here from one to two, and then another element from two to three. Each element is gonna have one, two nodes at each end. And in total, we are gonna have three nodes. Each node is gonna have two degrees of freedom. So three nodes, two degrees of freedom, the element is going to have six degrees of freedom. So our stiffness matrix is going to be six by six. But for this, we are going to, to solve the problem, we are going to follow the same procedure that we follow for any other FEA problem. We find a stiffness matrix for each element, for element one, stiffness matrix for element two. We combine the two stiffness met matrices to find and assemble the stiffness matrix. We find the equivalent load on each node and nodal displacement. So our first task is to find a stiffness matrix for each element. I'm showing you here how you can simplify it in, in Excel. You can use MATLAB as well. Here is a, the top is the equation for the stiffness matrix. So for the two elements, E is the same, I is the same, just the length of the element is different for each case. So if you go here, the length of the element for element one is five meter, for element two is 2.5 meter. That's the only difference that we have in a stiffness matrix. So if you replace the value, we find K1 and K2. These are local uh, stiffness matrices. So a stiffness matrix, we have to write a stiffness matrix in uh, global coordinates. 
for global coordinates, the thickness matrix is six by six. And the first element, the last two columns and the last two rows are zero because the first element has nothing to do with the, this, with the degrees of freedom here. So that's why these values are zero. For the second element is the opposite. The first two rows and the first two columns are zero because the element two has nothing to do with node one. But we need to write it in a global format so we could simply add them together and find the assembled global assistance metric or the total stiffness matrix. Once we have the stiffness matrix, then we can write a RFA equation, which is K times U equals F. But before that, we need to find the loading. We said that the loading, we have to replace and find the equivalent loading on each node. So we are going to find the equivalent loading on, on each node. So this problem uh, is a single distributed loading. So we already found the equivalent load on each node. For the forces, we have negative WL over two, and then for the moments, negative L squared over 12. And that's for element one is node one and node two. One thing that you need to pay attention is the equivalent load. When we are gonna find the equivalent load on each node, we are not finding the reaction forces here. We have already used reaction forces to find the equivalent load for a distributed loading earlier and then flip the signs to find the equivalent load. But for actual problem, we are just interested in the equivalent load on, on each node. So even though this, there is no reaction moments here, but for an FEA problem, when we have WL here, we are gonna put WL on each side of our beam because our nodes can have rotation, so they need to have a corresponding uh, moment. So that's why our node two, we are gonna have a moment for even node two as well. So we write the loading for our element one, and then we write the loading on element two, and then the loading matrix, I kept it as a global matrix. So for element one, because there is no nodes at here, element one does not have any uh, nodes in uh, a tree, these two are zero. For element two is the opposite. The first two components are zero. So here we, we found the loading matrix for each element. The first two, are the loading for the first node, the second two are the loading for the second node. And same thing here. Now we are gonna add the two uh, loading metrics to find the global loading matrix. Now that I have the stiffness, I have the loading, I can find the U values. But before doing that, I need to apply boundary conditions on my both stiffness matrix and the loading matrix. Applying uh, boundary conditions, we have to go to the problem and see what boundary conditions we have. At node A, both degrees of freedom are zero. Both the first degree of freedom and the second degree of freedom. The first degree of freedom is V, the second degree of freedom is rotation. So both of them are zero. So we need to remove the corresponding row and the corresponding column. And if you look at the, and we have a, another boundary condition here, which is not shown here. For this boundary condition, we don't have any displacement. We don't have any V, but we have theta. So one of them, the first uh, nodal displacement is zero. So we have to remove the third row and the third column. So now our stiffness matrix is actually three by three. If we have this reduced the stiffness matrix and reduced load, we can find our nodal displacement. So for FEA problems, whenever we have a value for nodal displacement, like zero, 
then we don't have, we can find a reaction for this later on. Or if you don't have any value, then that means that you don't have any reaction forces. You can find displacement and reaction forces at the same time in, in FEA. So here we know the nodal values for the first three components. For the next three components, we are gonna use the inversion matrix to find the nodal displacement. We find a nodal displacement here. For the last three values that for First three, if you want to write it in the global format, where zero. Now that we have the nodal displacement for the whole model, which is which has two elements and three nodes, I can find a reaction force. If you remember the equation for reaction forces, we separated the reaction force from the loading. If k u minus f we give us rho, now we have everything. We have the k matrix. We need to remember, we need to write it in an unreduced format. We have the K matrix, we have U, we have F, we can find uh, R here. And for the first three, the nodal displacement was zero. We have the reactions here. The first one would be uh, the force. The second one would be the moment. That's why the unit is Newton meter. And then the third, we have a reaction force for uh, node two as well. And the values are positive. So it's uh, based on uh, positive y direction and counterclockwise for, for the moment. Now we talked about beam elements and we have talked about bar elements. Frame is a combination of bar and beam elements, which means that we are gonna add a degree of freedom to our element. So in addition to transfer displacement, on the rotation, you're gonna add extension as well. So this is our new degree of freedom. So each node has three degrees of freedom. So if you have an element with two nodes, you're gonna have six degrees of freedom per element. But frame has the advantage that it combines the bar element properties. We can have extension and also we can have transverse loading. So we can have combination of loading. We have, these are the first node degrees of freedom, and these are the second node degrees of freedom. So for our local stiffness metric would be six by six. So for a bar element, if you remember, the stiffness matrix was EA or one negative one, negative one, one. For beam element, we just found the stiffness matrix now we are saying that the frame element is the combination of bar and beam element. So we have to assemble the two stiffness matrices. One is the stiffness matrix is four by four. Here is two by two. Our frame is going to be six by six. And we are going to assemble it into the frame element. We assemble the approach for assembling is the same way that you're going to assemble uh, two elements into their global, two uh, stiffness elements into their global uh, stiffness matrix. We're going to look at the nodal displacement. We're going to see here, first one is U, V, theta, and then you have U2, V2, theta2. The one, and then here is U1, V1, theta1, U2, V2, theta2. The U1, U1, that would be here, EAL, the one that I show by red, the, the one that are responsible for the extension is EA over L, the cross section, U2 and uh, U2, or U2 and U1. And here, or you have V1, theta1, V2, theta2, V1, theta1. V2 theta 2 and V1 V1, you can find a value 12 EIL cubed, which is 12 EI over L cubed, which is this value. So we just assembled the two stiffness matrices to find a stiffness matrix for a frame element. Again, frame element is very uh, helpful for us because it has three degrees of freedom in, in 2D and it can handle uh, all types of uh, loading. So using a 1D element, which is very efficient, we can find uh, deformation in every direction. 
uh, if, if you want to find a stiffness matrix in global coordinate, if you have a rotation here, if it's not in our x and y, and we have multiple components, you need to use the transformation matrix. So you need to remember the transformation Nation matrix in 2D was simply cosine, sine, negative sine, cosine. And if you want to write it in 3D um, with rotation about the axis, which means that the Z component, the Z axis is not rotating. We just are going to include it in, in our analysis. So that's it's just one. So we are still the rotation is on X, Y plane and is about the axis. So that's for one node I. If you want to write it for the whole element, Needs two nodes, and that's the transformation matrix that we are going to have in in 3D about the axis. So, if I want to find the stiffness matrix, the global stiffness matrix, if you remember the equation here, is a transformation, the inverse of transformation matrix, K, T. So, for frames that are not oriented in a global a stiffness uh, global coordinate, we need to find the transform the stiffness matrix using this equation. So you're going to solve a problem for our assemble the stiffness matrix for, for this frame. This frame has two members. So we need to, you have to at least use two elements. We call this element one, call this element two. And then we have three nodes. Is to find the assemble the stiffness matrix, we need to find the local stiffness matrix for this guy as well as this guy. So here is our element one and element two. So element one is towards x and y. Element two is not. We have a transformation. But the angle of transformation is very important. So we calculate the angle based on counterclockwise. So if you rotate x, y counterclockwise to this, you get x, and then you flip it to y. Means the angle is 270 degrees. It's not 90. It's negative 90 or positive 270 for, for this element. So that's the angle of rotation for element two. For element one, uh, the stiffness matrix, we have the stiffness matrix, we'll replace the value for element two, we have the stiffness matrix, we replace it with the value, the A and I are the same for both. The only thing that is different is the length, one of them is 10 feet, the other one is uh, nine feet. So for now, I just found the local stiffness matrix for uh, each element, regardless of what their rotation is. I just replace the values into my stiffness matrix for frame. I have two elements, so I have two local stiffness matrices. And each element has six degrees of freedom, so my stiffness matrix has in, in a local coordinate, each of them is going to have, it's going to be six by six. Now for element two, because I have rotation, I need to use a transformation matrix. So the transformation matrix is here, the first component, and uh, T equation is asking for T inverse, but T inverse we have shown previously is equal to T transpose, or you can use negative theta. And I have the stiffness matrix that we found here, and also the transformation matrix again. And then I will find my K2 in, in a global coordinate. If I add the two, if I assemble the two stiffness matrices, uh, I will find the global stiffness matrices. Uh, so uh, each element is uh, gonna have three, uh, each node has three degrees of freedom. I have three nodes in total, so my stiffness matrix would be uh, nine by nine. I have nine degrees of freedom for my model. <coughs> because I have three nodes and each node has three degrees of freedom in, in frames. Now we're gonna look at the beam elements in ANSYS. Whenever we talk about beam element uh, in ANSYS, we are actually referring to frame elements. So all the elements can have extension as well. 
So we call them beam, but they're actually frame elements are more uh, versatile. And we can categorize them into 2D beam elements or 3D beam elements. Uh, you need to be careful whenever we are using the word 2D and 3D. Beam is a 1D element. I mean, degree of freedom only depends on extraction. But when we are talking about 2D, which means that the degree of freedom can be in 2D. We can have U, V, and, and W. Or we can have theta, alpha, and gamma. So that depends on the degree of freedom that each node has, not the beam element itself. The beam element itself is, is 1D. I cannot emphasize that enough. So we can categorize the elements in, in FVA, in ANSYS, whether they are 2D, beam 3, 23, 54, or 3D beam elements, we have five uh, choices. But these are all just random numbers for us. It really doesn't mean anything unless we know what properties are we interested in. First of all, the degree of freedom. Are we interested in finding the deformation in Z direction as well or not? Or 2D uh, is enough. Uh, uh, simple beam element with three degrees of freedom at each node is gonna have six degrees of freedom but if you are using a 3D element with three nodes and each one would be six, six and six, so you are dealing with 18 degrees of freedom. As the degree of freedom gets larger, the stiffness and metrics gets larger and your computational cost would go higher. If you need it, that's fine. If you don't need it, you really don't need to use higher order elements. And the choice of element, the property that we are interested in. Are we interested in material nonlinearity, plasticity, creep? Some of them can handle it, some of them can't. Geometry nonlinearity, large deformation, rotation, etc. Some of these elements can handle it, some of them can't. The other important feature that we need to look at in choice of element is which beam theory uh, each element is based on. Are we using Euler Bernoulli or Timoshenko beam? What size of beam are we modeling? For thick beam, we have to use Timoshenko beam or go to the solid elements. So here I'm just showing you a brief description of each element. Beam three is the simplest case. It has three degrees of freedom. Beam two on E3 also has three degrees of freedom because it's all of them are in 2D, but it can handle material nonlinearity. So if material nonlinearity is of interest, use beam 23. If not, just use beam three is simpler and more computationally uh, efficient. Beam 54 is a 2D, so three degrees of freedom at each node, but it can handle unsymmetric geometry or tapered geometry. If your beam is tapered, you can have beam 54. In 3D, we have uh, more choices. So each degree of freedom is six for beam four, which is an equivalent version of beam three in 3D. Beam 54 is an equivalent of beam 54 in 3D. It's unsymmetric geometry, so it's paper, but it has six degrees of freedom compared to beam 54, the, uh, the 2D broader of beam 44. Beam 24 can handle material nonlinearity, is an equivalent of beam 23 in 2D. And we have beam 188 and beam 189, so these are a little bit more complicated. Uh, beam elements because they are based on Timoshenko beam theory. So it can handle shear deformation as well. And so it has six degrees of freedom, but it can have the seventh degree of freedom as well, which is the warping of the cross section. So technically, they have seven degrees of uh, freedom. Beam 189 is a three node beam element. Uh, so each each element is gonna have uh, three nodes. So it's, it's proper for handling slender or stubby beam elements. So beam 189 and beam 188 are, are the same. The only difference is that beam 189 has a three node, uh, the three node element. And you can see that they can handle both Material nonlinearity as well as geometry nonlinearity. So, material nonlinearity, geometry nonlinearity, Timoshenko beam, which can handle shear deformation. So, beam 189 and beam 188 are, are pretty complete. If you can solve your problem uh, 
uh, using BIM 189 or BIM 188 to stick with it rather than going to the solid elements because it's much more straightforward and it's easier to, to analyze. 